morning, as Sophia said. And I'm going to talk about building with biomolecules. So you might think, like, how does somebody from the electrical engineering work with biomolecules? And so, um, actually, the, the reason why electrical engineers work in the scale is that microelectronics, like you have in your computer or your mobile phone, is built in a nanoscale. And so we know the technologies to build things on a very small scale. And actually, I come from the department of micro and nano systems. Well, the name is part of the electrical engineering school. And so what we do is we build small things. That's what we're good at. And then instead of only building it in, in, in a silicon, we learn to do it in polymers or in plastics or in biomaterials and so on and so forth. And so we spread out to many more domains. So I would say more than half of the research we're doing today is in the life science area, uh, maybe one quarter is in the IT area, and another quarter is the transport area, where we're looking to sensors and, and, and systems like that. This is an overview of the research in my specific group. Uh, most of the research focuses either on diagnostics, for example, detection of infectious diseases, detection of viruses in air, um, and here detection of DNA I'm going to talk a little bit more about, and then also some therapeutics, for example, where we work with spider silk and where we work with cell therapy for uh, cancer treatment. I will talk more specifically about three examples. One is about building with silk and building with DNA, because it suits and it links to the to the to what has been told before. So spider silk. Um, what people in the bio school do is that they produce, as Emily showed, they produce uh, spider silk molecules, proteins. And we get those in a little bottle and our task is to take these proteins and build something with it, like a silk structure, but just proteins. I thought the first thing to show is uh, a movie, I don't know how to start that. So we had our first publication together, I, this is a co-publication of my group, together with uh, colleagues of Sophia and Amelie, where we had a high impact uh, in, a, in a very nice journal, a publication on our first structures of spider silk. And there was a movie that's out since Monday. So these are the silk proteins that are built. So silk we find in nature and it's bioactive. And then we can build them also using bacteria, as you can see here in these flasks. And then they come to our group and there we take droplets of these silk proteins and we turn them into structures. I'm going to show more in detail how we do that in a few slides. Very tiny, two, three hundred nanometer diameters, extremely tiny structures. Right? So, silk is an interesting material. It's very strong, it's flexible, but the main reason why we're interested in it is that it's biocompatible. So, we can use it in life science applications. I'm going to talk about some of them. And so, spiders and silkworms, they produce silk. But it's very difficult, especially when we look at spider silk, which is an interesting material to create that, to harvest that from the, from the nature. Because spiders, they are predators, they're cannibalistic. So if you put three spiders in a box, very soon you only have one spider in a box. And so what we do is then we use this kind of expression systems that uh, Amelie talked about also. So you take some of the DNA of the spider, put it in E. coli bacteria, they'll produce the, the proteins, the spidroids that form the spider silk. And then they purify that, and that's what we get, a little flask with spit joints, with these molecules. And not only do we take the DNA, we also have the opportunity here to change a little bit of the DNA. And that's typically some of the things that Sophia works with. So she's been helping, for example, the Z domain that you talked about. You extracted that and put that in the DNA. And so now we get spider molecules with Z domains. So we get spider molecules that bind to antibodies. Or we make spider molecules that bind to living cells, or that, uh, that um, help living cells to, to grow on the silk. So we call that fibronectin. So here's the Z silk and the fibronectin silk. Ah. And so when we get this flask, how do we make, how, how do we get these structures out of it? Well, we have one interesting property that we use, and that is that if you take a droplet of the solution and you let it evaporate, so you upconcentrate it, that the spit joints that are in solution, they will self-assemble at a hydrophobic interface. So at the, the interface of the liquid against a Hydrophobic surface, that means like a Teflon surface, or against the air. So you're going to create a spontaneous layer of silk out of that. The 
can see that it's because these molecules that are in one state, when they reach that state, they're gonna transform into so the beta sheet formation. So they're gonna align and form a silk sheet. And so the only thing we have to do is to control this process in time and in space. So if we can control the evaporation in the right moment, we can make different structures depending on how we do that. The person in my group doing that, you see a picture here, and you see the live person standing there. This is Linnea Gustafsson. She's the first that did all the experiments behind that and a lot of the design work and the writing work. And so here you can see how we make three different structures. If we put a little droplet, say a two millimeter diameter droplet on a, coat, a pillar coating, so we make a super hydrophobic surface, so that means we make silicon surface with little pillars. They are only 10 micron high pillars and 10 micron apart typically, and they're coated with a Teflon-like layer, so they're water repellent. So you put this droplet on top, the droplet doesn't go in, it just lays there on top, and when you remove it, it moves with it. So you put it on top and take it away, you leave very little droplets of silk solution behind, and they dry and form a silk film. So you get a coating, an array coating. If we roll the droplet, as you could see in the movie, what happens is you, you create a veal of liquid behind and the veal dries and the surface tension makes that it splits and you get a nice array of little wires behind. If you just put the droplet and just let it sit and dry entirely, we get like a pancake of silk, a silk sheet, we call that. So let's see some of the things. So here you see the pillar coating. This is actually an image of such a pillar array, a forest. So the size of this image is the width of a human hair. To give you some perspective. So these are these 10 micron pillars. And these pillars are everywhere, but you only see the green ones. These green ones are the ones that are fluorescently labeled. So here we have silk, and once we have deposited the silk, we wash over a fluorescent molecule, and actually a fluorescent antibody, and the antibody binds very specifically, as, as um, he explained, the antibody binds very specifically to the silk, and so only where we have the silk, we get a green dot. And so you can nicely see this is where the droplet has touched and where it has released. And you can use this potentially to do now protein assay. So if you have, for example, now a specific antibody, sorry, spe specific antibody bound here, and you put like a blood droplet or plasma droplet on that, specific antibodies can bind to specific pillars, and then you're going to get a color change dependent on whether you have that molecule in your blood or not. So you can use this for diagnostics. The nano wires, you saw already pictures of that. This is a zoomed out picture, again, 100 micrometers. So again, this is about the size of the human hair now. This and so you can see we get very nice lines of little wires. And these wires look thick, but they're extremely thin. They're only 300 nanometer. That's a thousand of the thickness of a hair. It's really small. And if you take these wires, and you, or you take this surface now, you see the pillars and the wires in between. If you put that in an ultrasound bath, they will release, and you get your wires in the solution. Now you can start using that, for example, for what we're doing now, and that's what Linnea is doing actually this week. She's working on that. We're trying now to make spider silk with antibacterial properties, there are peptides on the silk, and then if you have these wires you can put for example on a wound and hopefully the wound will heal better. This is one of the tests we're going to look at now. And then if we make the pancakes or the silk sheets, they don't look, they look like very beautiful pancakes, and so here, this, here we didn't have antibodies bound but we had fibronectin in the silk, and so this silk, uh, this, is, uh, this stimulates the growth of cells, and then we have put human cells here on top of the silk, then you create a very nice layer of human cells, and every blue dot here is actually the, the, the core of um, the, the nucleus of a cell. So you get a nice, controlled layer of cells. And now the latest work, this is free publishing, this is the first time we show this in public, is, okay, we can make this kind of uh, sheets, but what we're very interested in is actually grow uh, structures, like sm small organs. This is a new field emerging, it's called organ on a chip, where people grow small organites in a silicon chip, and you do that to study, for example, drug testing. So you grow an entire organ, but on a very small scale, and you give it drugs and see how the, how the tissue uh, results to that. And to be, be able to do that, what is very interesting to see is how do drugs go from the blood into the surrounding tissue. So it's a holy grail to create, to grow blood vessels on a chip. And so we're trying to do that with a silk sheet, and so what we're trying to do now is to create tubes of silk. Because if I have a tube of silk, I can grow epithelial cells or the blood vein cells on the inside and the tissue cells on the outside and then I can grow like a, a, a vein that's, that mimics an organ. And so to do that we created very small scaffolds. Again this is, um, this is the work of Hiroki sitting here, guest student in my lab. He makes this kind of structures, they're a few millimeter long and two millimeter wide. There are scaffolds and actually there's a 3D structure but if you see, if you look from the top it looks like a 
hydrophobic pillar forest. If you look from the side, it also looks like hydrophobic uh, uh, forest. So for every side you look, it looks like a hydrophobic surface. And so what we can do now is we can, you can see that behind that water bottle. You see small droplets that you put on here, they just lay there. And so we can put, for example, silk on this side, turn it, put silk on the other side, turn it, put silk on the other side. And so you can coat this entire structure with silk. And this is how it looks like. If you put this in an electron microscope, you see now a zoom in of this point here, and you see between each of these pillars we have a little sheet of silk grown. So this has now formed actually a hollow tube structure which, and that's surrounded by silk. And this, you can see that when you dip this into blue dye, it sucks up capillary, it sucks up blue dye. So we have really a silk tube structure formed. Uh, the last part what I'm going to talk about, this is building with silk. We also build using DNA. DNA is a very nice building material, actually. And what we're doing here is what we're mainly interested in is uh, diagnostics. So DNA is, of course, a building corner, cornerstone of, a, of, a, uh, in, of life. And we want to measure what kind of DNA do we have in our blood, or do we have in a sample, or some liquid. Do we find, for example, bacterial DNA, or cancer DNA, etc. So you want to have a liquid sample and massively check, do I have a specific type of DNA, yes or no there? Huh? And so the way to do that, what we would like to do is find a little piece of DNA and electrically measure it. You know, we can put two electrodes on both sides and measure, oh, here's the DNA. That would be very easy because you have an immediate electrical readout of your DNA. Unfortunately, that's not possible because DNA is not conductive. But now you can do a little trick. If I take two electrodes and I span a little bit of DNA between the two, then I can bind metallic particles to the DNA. So this is DNA strand and little nanoparticles are bound here. You see, this is 50 nanometer. These particles must be like 20 nanometer size. And so now I have a conductive link between this electrode and this electrode. And you can see how small things you have to build to do that. It's a bit cumbersome, yeah, isn't it? So we thought, let's do that in a way more easier way and more parallel fashioned way. And so what we did, and this is the work of Mao Xiang. Mao Xiang is sitting in the green t-shirt. He's a PhD student doing all the experiments here. So here we start with a sheet of a plastic. It's a polyethylene. 10 micron thick, so it can just, just like an overhead slide. And it's porous, so if you look in a microscope, you see like little holes of 10, one to two micrometers, go straight through the, to the plastic. And we start with putting a gold layer on the top and on the bottom of this plastic. And so if you put like an electrode, you can try to measure, you won't measure anything because they, these are not, sorry, these are not connected to each other. There's no electrical connection here. So now what we're gonna try to do is thread DNA through from one side to the other and then put the nanoparticles and try to short circuit these two sides. And that will tell us whether we have DNA or not. This is how we do it. We put a capture probe, specific sequence of DNA. And then if I have DNA in my sample here, the red ones, they will very specifically bind to only this specific ca capture probe. So I have a mixture of maybe thousand different types of DNA. Specifically, some of them I'm gonna bind. And now I have bound little piece of DNA that are maybe 50 nanometer long. And this is 10 micrometers, so my DNA is not long enough. I can't stretch it through it, so I need to make it longer. We use a, a technology called Rolex circle amplification. And basically, well, this, this is a biochemical reaction in one hour. It takes the strand of DNA and copies the same thing again and again and again and again, like a few thousand times. And so in an hour you have about, or in two hours you have about um, a 70 micrometer long strand of DNA. And this DNA just sits together. It's not stretched out. DNA in a liquid typically will coil up. You can see this like a ball of wool. It's not like a nice line, it's a ball of wool, it's completely coiled up. So we need to uncoil it and get it through these holes. <coughs> and now we use a property of DNA. DNA is negatively charged. Yeah? And so if you put it in water, water molecules, they have like a, a they are polar, they have a negative and a, and a positive side. So water molecules are gonna nicely arrange around the DNA and this whole structure likes each other because the charges are close to each other. We call this, as, this is a energetically favorable to have the DNA in solution in a coiled up phase but we want to uncoil it. So what do we do? One side of the DNA here is heated to the surface where we captured it, and so we're gonna remove the water. So if this is a surface and my DNA is stuck here and I remove the water in that way, the ball of wool is gonna try to follow, but it has to, it's stuck with one side. So the further I move the liquid, the more I roll out my ball of DNA. And so we do that here, not on the flat surface, but through this pore. So we suck the liquid through and we force the DNA to uncoil and move to the other side. And does this really work? Well, yeah, it, this works. And then we put on the nanoparticles of gold. See, they bind along the DNA specifically. And still we have no contact because these particles are too small. So we need to do a little bit of 
not electroplating, but electroless plating. It's a gold enhancement solution. So after 10, 20 minutes, we get little wires going from one side to the other. Now the question is, does this work? Well, when you look in an SEM, this, uh, my electron microscope again, you see, you see here the, the top of the membrane and you see the holes here. The first thing you see is these very tiny grains here. Uh, these tiny grains these are the gold nanoparticles that we see that, that have not reacted, they just fell down. And then we see these wire-like structures here. They are 300 mm -hmm. nanometer wires. And they go from one point typically and they go into a hole. And here you see another one, here another one. And so what this is, this is the DNA on which we have the, the, the gold particles bound and then enhanced the gold. Uh, so this is, here we see the DNA wires on top of the surface. We still don't know where they go to because we can't see inside the pores. We also see like balls like laying here. Now what these are, these are our balls of wool that for some reason didn't stretch, they stayed together in a ball. And also they reacted and they form like a ball of gold but no wire. Uh, so we can clearly see different structures emerging when we do that. Now we want to see what's inside the membrane because we see it goes in the, in the hole but does it go all the way through. And so we can look with a uh, fluorescent microscope, confocal microscope. And so we take like pictures, fluorescent pictures, layer by layer by layer by layer by layer. You put them all in a computer and then you regenerate the image. And you call that uh, a confocal image. And you can't do that with gold, but if we take away the gold and instead put on little fluorescent probes instead of the gold nanoparticles, then we can actually see them. And here you see a picture. This is the, this is the top view. You see, we see dots in certain points. We think these are the holes. We can't see that here, but we actually know these are the holes. And if you look on the side view, you can see we get nice 10 micrometer long strands of fluorescent color going somewhere. And we see, so this must be the, the membrane, 10 micron thick, and these are wires that go through this membrane. I have a little movie showing a 3D view of this thing. It gives you a better view of these strands going all the way through the membrane and really connecting one side to the other. And so the final question we have to ask, can we measure the electrical resistance? And yes, we can. So if we start with DNA concentration of 50 femtomolar molar or more, so, 50, so you know, I have, I have like a molar, millimolar, micromolar, nanomolar, picomolar, Femtomolar, so this is very low. So if we have 50, 50 femtomolar or low, we can actually measure a conductance. If we go below that, we don't measure anything. We get something above one tera ohm, and you can't see it here, so I can't show the control measurement. But we can actually detect it whenever we have more than that. And so if you're interested in fabricating in the micro nanoscale, be it with biomaterials or not, uh, and I know you're master students, I believe, most of you, you can follow the course Microsystem Technology. It's you can follow it in most of the program, it's eligible. I know for medical technology, for electro for sure. And, or if you're interested in, in a master thesis in this area, you can also. Right, thank you.